And I would just, I would invite anyone to read what the, the New Testament and the Old Testament say about slavery to see that they were on fairly firm ground, that the, that the, the balance of the, of the honest reading was on the side of clearly we can, we can keep slaves, right? Jesus, well, Je Jesus never envisioned a world w without slavery and he admonished slaves to serve their masters well and to serve their Christian masters especially well. The so, English Protestants wouldn't have agreed with that because, like I said, they were at the forefront of the fight against the, slavery. Okay, so but, uh, but, but I think they, there they was were clearly influenced of... by something outside the text. And th this is, again, it's, th th you're making this harder than it is, and my concern is why. Right? Well, because I don't think I am, Sam, because I think that the fundamental message in the New Testament, for example, is that so each then you don't individual acknowledge that the old Testament. If we so so Jews are in possession of a book that has some diabolical passages that would be better left out. <laughs> the theoretical physicist Steven Weinberg once said that religion is an insult to human dignity. With or without it, you would have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, that takes religion. It's a very powerful, albeit imperfect, quote that I'm reminded of nearly every time I see the religious attempt to justify the atrocities of their scripture. Be it grotesque misogyny, violent homophobia, or straight-up slavery, the religious either accept and celebrate such verses, as is the case with many Jews, Christians, and most Muslims when it comes to misogyny and homophobia, or they go to breathtakingly disingenuous lengths to dismiss, justify, and contextualise these verses as is the case with them all when it comes to slavery. No, no, they cry, it was indentured servitude. That's all, it was voluntary, and after six years you were let free anyway. Love thy neighbor, that's what matters. Slavery in the Hebrew culture was volitional. It was voluntary means of working off debt. It was not perpetual is the other thing worth pointing out. Uh, so it didn't transcend generations. It's not that slavery was endorsed by the Bible. It's that slavery is universal among human civilization until it, modern it, it, times. But it, if somebody had lost themselves to debt, it was basically like a type of bankruptcy law. They would enter into that voluntarily. Working for a gentle, caring, loving master was the best of all possible worlds. This is three justifications for scriptural slavery, debunked. Let's pretend that you thought that God existed, and that you and that you were He, uh, and it was and it was your job to convey to a group of human beings what you think morality should be, understanding that they're going to take that and develop that because we do have this gift of human reason that we use to develop things. I know one thing for sure. I'd have said, thou shall not have slaves, rather than, say, thou shall not work on the Sabbath, or thou shall not wear clothing mixed of wool and linen. Because, maybe it's just me, but I'd count owning other people as property as a tad bit worse than mixing wool and linen. Before we delve into the three primary justifications of Abrahamic slavery, it's worth tersely reminding ourselves of what the scripture actually says. Slavery is rampant throughout both the Old and New Testaments, which together provide rules and regulations for several categories of slave. Exodus 21 verses 2 through 6 distinguishes Hebrew male slaves by commanding that they are to be set free after six years. What's more, if they came into slavery with a family, they too are to be liberated. However, if they developed a family during their six years, they'd either have to forsake them or join them in slavery forever. Moving on, verse 7 clearly establishes a category for Hebrew female slaves, in which it states that fathers can sell their Hebrew daughters into slavery, and that they, quote, shall not go out like the other men's servants do. And as for foreign slaves, or heathen, things were unsurprisingly worse. Leviticus 25, verse 44 through 46, states that foreigners can be brought, sold, and passed down as inheritance, and that so too can their children. And while Deuteronomy 24 verse 7 prohibits the kidnapping of Israelites, and Exodus 21 verse 16 seemingly prohibits the kidnapping of foreigners too, there is no verse that prohibits the buying of slaves. And what's more, Numbers 31 verses 17 to 18 states that the spoils of war are to be dealt with as follows. Execute all the men and little boys, as well as the women who have known a man by lying with him, but keep a life for yourselves or the little girls who have not known a man by lying with him. If that's not kidnapping, then I don't know what is. 
And as for the treatment of slaves, who were referred to as servants, bondmaids, and bondmen, it was brutal. Exodus 21 verses 20 to 21 entails that masters can beat their slaves as hard and often as they please so long as their slaves are not blinded in one or both eyes and that they don't die within a few days. Hence, broken limbs, fractured skulls and hemorrhaging lacerations are not to be punished, whether the victim is innocent or otherwise. Shall be beaten with many stripes. Shall be beaten with many stripes. Now many signifies a great many, 40, 100, 150 lashes. That's scripture. But then Jesus and the New Testament overturned all of these barbaric regulations, when in Peter 2 verse 18 the following was said unto thee, Set free thy bondmaids and bondmen, for it is an abomination to own another as slave. Only kidding, it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only the good and gentle, but also the froward. Indeed, the New Testament offers no explicit condemnation of slavery, but in fact reassures it. For example, Ephesians 6 verse 5 states, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. And 1 Timothy 6 verse 1 states, let as many servants that are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour, that the name of God and his doctrine not be blasphemed. Now to be fair, some verses do actually caution masters to treat their slaves, quote, fairly, such as Colossians 4 verse 1, which states, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. And the same sentiment is echoed in Ephesians 6 verse 9. But I must say, I'm with Alex O'Connor on this one. The only fair treatment of slaves is their immediate emancipation with adequate compensation. The only, I'll repeat, the only appropriate regulation on slavery is its abolition. Anything less than this at the very least demonstrates that God doesn't feel as strongly about it as he does, say, divorce or adultery. Okay, with our scripture session over, let's get to the apologetics. While some argue that their scripture doesn't endorse slavery whatsoever, most accept that it does, but they insist that the type that it endorses is in stark contrast to that of the transatlantic slave trade. Or in other words, they make out that it's not really slavery. We'll get to the actual argument soon enough, but for now, here are a few examples of this proclamation. The modern slave trade, the slave trade that, that took men and women from West Africa, kidnapped them, sold them, put them on ships and brought them on the Middle Passage to the British colonies and then to the United States and sold them like cattle, uh, that, is, that is expressly forbidden by the Bible, which forbids, prohibits kidnapping and selling people. We must differentiate between the bond servants of the Old Testament, the Greco-Roman practice of slavery where slaves could own property and purchase their freedom, and the transatlantic slave trade, an unequaled race-based horror of the 17th to 19th centuries. That was something quite different to anything in the New Testament or the Old. I'm a child of the 70s, so in the miniseries Roots, when Kunta Kunte was uh, savagely taken from his own land by a bunch of kidnappers. Now what's really interesting is the Bible does talk about that kind of slavery two times that I can think of very specifically. And when it does, it absolutely and outright condemns it. Slavery in the Bible is not the same as harsh slavery uh, that other people often think of, you know, which occurred here in the Americas or in uh, Europe. Slavery in the Bible was very different than the slavery that was practiced in our country. So there's the claim. Proponents insist that the slavery mandated by their scripture doesn't remotely resemble the brutality of the transatlantic slave trade. Now, after digesting hours and hours of apologetics, you're welcome, I've seen predominantly three justifications or arguments given. But before I address them, I want to make eminently clear that this position, even if it was true, is a reprehensible embodiment of the relative privation fallacy which is more commonly known as the not as bad as fallacy. Which is to say, even if the transatlantic slave trade was significantly worse than that mandated by Holy Scripture, that wouldn't in any way render the latter good. There is no good or proper or decent way in which to own other human beings. To again quote good old 
well, young Alex. Proper treatment of slaves is a contradiction in terms. So with that point made, let's get to the arguments already. One of the most frequent given, and one that featured quite prominently in the previous compilation, is that scriptural slavery is strictly voluntary. And here's it better put. First of all, Old Testament slavery was not race-based for servitude. It was voluntary means of working off debt or keeping captives from mustering a rebellion. In essence, it was the first type of bankruptcy law. Now see, back in ancient times, if a person had lost themselves to debt, had become incompetent with their finances, really what happened is someone would say, I want to I wanna get paid, and they said, oh, we don't have the money. Well, fine, they'd throw you in jail till you paid it. Well, you didn't make anything when you were in jail, so by and large, you were just in jail for the rest of your life. In the Hebrew culture, slavery was primarily volitional. So in other words, if a person was too poor to provide for themselves or if they were in debt, they would oftentimes hire themselves out to someone who was richer who could provide for them or pay off all of their debt. So what's being described here is what's known as debt slavery, and it was extremely prevalent among ancient civilizations. For example, the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi allowed debtors to sell themselves, their wives, and their children into slavery for up to three years. The entire Greco-Roman world recognized it as a distinct legal category, and yes, it was also recognized and practiced by the Israelites. However, likewise to the Babylonians, Greeks, and Romans, it was an option only available to their own people. Leviticus 25 verse 39 through 42 states that if thy brother be sold upon thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant, but as a hired servant, for they are my servants, which I brought forth from the land of Egypt. But the following verses, 44 through 46 states, both thy bond men and thy bond maids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bond men and bond maids and they shall be your possession, and ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them as a possession. They shall be your bondmen for ever. What's more, Numbers 31 verses 17 to 18 entails that when you conquer a foreign land, you must slaughter all of the men, women, and little boys, but keep alive for yourselves all the little girls who have not known a man by lying with him. How's that for voluntary? They would enter into that voluntarily. It was voluntary volitional. Moving on, the second argument I'd like to address is that scriptural slavery is not indefinite. Proponents often claim that the status of slavery expires after six years, and that upon such a time, slaves were set free. It was not perpetual is the other thing worth pointing out. Uh, so it didn't transcend generations. And you know what? After six years, they were set free on the seventh year. So really what it was, was it was taking somebody who had been incompetent with their finances, training them, getting, getting them back, so that when they go back out into the society, that they would do a pretty good job. Slavery was limited to just six years, and so the idea here is that it was never God's heart for the rich to overtake or control the poor. On the contrary, this system was set up so that slaves or people who were in debt could work off their debt in a safe and loving environment. It's a real question in the Old Testament whether the word for slave should be translated as, as slave. Perhaps bond servant might be a better word for this time-limited service where if you were in debt, you could sell yourself to a master for a time. Now, you probably know exactly where I'm going to go with this one because we've just been there. Just as proponents equate the regulations for Israelite slaves with foreign slaves when it comes to volition, so too is the case when it comes to longevity. Exodus 21 verse 2 states, If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and on the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. And this is further supported by Deuteronomy 15 verse 12, which states, And if thy brother, a Hebrew man, or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let them go free from thee. However, this six-year rule was not granted to foreign slaves. To the contrary, in fact, the scripture frequently refers to foreign slaves as permanent property, with no way in which for them to earn their freedom. To use just the previous example, Leviticus 25 commands that foreign slaves can be brought, sold, and passed down as inheritance. And it even says, And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen for 
ever. It was not perpetual. After six years, they were set free. Slavery was limited to just six years. But it didn't transcend generations. Time limited service forever. Would you please, for God's sake, stop lying for God? Stop equating the regulations for Israelite slaves with foreign slaves, because your scripture, your God, incessantly distinguishes the two, and your failure to admit this doesn't fool anyone who's earnestly paying attention, and it certainly wouldn't fool your God if he so existed. Which he doesn't, and so you're very, very lucky. And finally, let's get to the third frequent argument given, that being that scripture explicitly condemns the practice of forced slavery or kidnapping, and that therefore the transatlantic slave trade would have been unconsciousable to adherents of both the Old and New Testament. The modern slave trade, the slave trade that, that took men and women from West Africa, kidnapped them, sold them, put them on ships and brought them on the Middle Passage to the British colonies and then to the United States and sold them like cattle, uh, that, is, that is expressly forbidden by the Bible, which forbids, prohibits kidnapping and selling people. The transatlantic slave trade would have been and should have been unthinkable based on both Old and New Testaments. Both Testaments outlaw man-stealing, right? You cannot kidnap people and sell them as slaves. It was a capital offense in the Old Testament. I want to read you a passage here in Exodus uh, chapter 21, verse 16. He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him, or is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. Now that's a pretty serious judgment on someone who is a slave trader who goes out and kidnaps people and uh, takes them into the slave trade to be sold uh, as a slave. Kidnapping, according to Exodus chapter 21, in any and all circumstances, was completely and totally outlawed and punishable by death. And so this idea that you could take somebody against their will and make them your slave was not only against the law, but it was outside of the will of God. Now this argument, at least in my opinion, is actually a bit stronger than the previous two. And that's because in isolation, Exodus 21 verse 16 seems pretty damn solid. Exodus uh, chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. In Exodus 21. Indeed, the verse clearly states that those who kidnap others and enslave them shall be executed. However, there are at least two crucial things to consider. One, kidnapping is only one way in which to become a slave. Others include being born into it, extortion, exploitation, coercion, debt, debt inheritance, trickery, and deception. Hence, this verse doesn't condemn slavery, it condemns kidnapping. And two, and more importantly, this verse does not, and nor does any verse in the Old or New Testament, condemn the buying of slaves who are kidnapped and especially foreign slaves. To the contrary, in fact, and as already thoroughly covered, Leviticus explicitly states that one can buy slaves from the heathen around them, and Numbers explicitly endorses the straight up kidnapping of conquered little girls. So yeah, loopholes. And talking of loopholes, <laughs> here's a doozy. Throughout the era of the transatlantic slave trade, in which an estimated 12 million Africans were forcefully enslaved and transported, Guess how many of those were kidnapped by American and European Christian slavers? Very few. The vast majority of slaves were purchased by Christians from African slavers who kidnapped their neighboring tribes, because buying kidnapped slaves is fine. After all, both thy bondmen and thy bondmaidens are to come from those around you. Anyhow, to bring this all back to Weinberg, Seeing otherwise good, decent, educated, and compassionate people attempt to justify and rationalize the reprehensible breaks my heart, and it's one of the biggest reasons that I do what I do. To paraphrase Hitchens, these people are poisoned. Look, whether we call it slavery, indentured servitude, or a bankruptcy scheme, to get a civilized person of today to try and justify the edicts of Leviticus and Numbers, that takes religion. Anyhow, I'm Stephen Woodford, and as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have supported the channel via other means. Until next time, my fellow apes. Until next time.